Hello, my name is Rick Pearson and welcome to Prophecy USA, a program specifically designed to unveil the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. You know, we've learned in past weeks how the Judeo-Christian faith influenced the founding fathers and the foundation of American culture. But what happens when a secular humanist culture inspired by fallen Babylonian spirits start invading the Judeo-Christian churches in America? Stay tuned, you do not want to miss this teaching today. Welcome back, folks. You know, in the last several programs, we've highlighted multiple descriptions of Babylon the Great. The United States of America meets every description. Her founding upon Judeo-Christian principles has made her a providential nation. Her covenant blessings from God has manifested through her wealth, her military, her global influence around the world, and she has become a lady of kingdoms, exactly as Isaiah and John described her. The fact that most providential nations described in Revelation 17 were symbolized by animals, with the seventh nation described as a woman, led us to conclude that this Lady Liberty represents the seventh nation who polices the world before the eighth and final New World Order beast system arrives. However, that Lady of Kingdoms, who brought liberty to all, is suddenly described in Revelation 17 as a mother of prostitutes who commits fornication and merchandises it to the kings of the earth. The Greek word here for fornication is pornea, where we get the word pornography. Hollywood now is the number one producer and distributor of pornographic films worldwide. Our school systems are now teaching six-year-old children how to pleasure themselves sexually and their gender identity. The medical world is transgendering children in Canada as young as 11 years old, with the government assistance literally taking them out of parents' custody. Recently, the LGBT marched down the streets, chanting, we're here, we're queer, and we're coming after your children. The Lady of Kingdoms has become the mother of Pornia as she flies the rainbow agenda under the nation's flag that used to represent one nation under God. And still, pulpits in this nation, prophecy teachers, and modern-day prophets refuse to acknowledge that America fits every biblical description that we've researched concerning Babylon the Great. So at this point in Babylon's description, a spiritual transformation takes place when the angel declares to John, fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. Instead of the church going into the world to preach the gospel, the world comes into the church to defile the gospel, even to the point that major denominations, Christian TV talk shows, and even the so-called elect refuse to enter into any dialogue concerning the handwriting on the wall prophesied to us in God's written word. Jesus warned us of the falling away and grouped believers into seven categories that he called churches. To each group he warned, let him who has ears hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. Immediately before Babylon is judged, as the bride gets raptured and the tribulation period begins. Listen to this. Jesus warns us in scripture that there will be an apostasia or spiritual falling away that will affect believers immediately before a great tribulation comes upon the earth. Historically, that falling away began in several churches during the time the book of Revelation was written. Jesus warns his followers of several types of sins that would seduce his church and lead them astray. Although those believers of yesteryear have passed away, the sins and the spirits they were wrestling with still exist. It is the sin that Jesus is addressing in these passages. These historical churches fall under the theological tool known as typology. 
Typology is a description or type of believer, then and there, exegesis, which represents what believers in the last days will look like in the here and now. In his admonition to the seven churches, Jesus says, I know your works. He is speaking to practicing Christians who are working in the churches, and he warns us today, just as he warned them 2,000 years ago, to let him who has ears hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. The first believers he addressed lived in Ephesus, as it says in Revelation 2. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. These believers have fallen from their first love for God. Jesus said in the Gospels, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Believers in Ephesus needed to restore their love for God, but especially their love for others. A close resemblance of believers in Ephesus are those in Sardis. Jesus speaks to the second church in Sardis in Revelation 3. He says, I know thy works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Repent, if you will not wake up. I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. The Apostle James, Jesus' brother, provides a solution for these believers. In James chapter 1 he says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, and goes away, and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being not hearer, but a doer, he will be blessed in his doing. Doers of the word were found in the next church called Smyrna. However, there was a price they paid in serving God. Jesus said to Smyrna, Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. These are the first three of the seven churches that Jesus addressed. Welcome back, folks. You know, our narrator has shown us in no uncertain terms that in the last days, the spiritual practices of believers as a whole is in a fallen state. Instead of believers going into all the world to preach the gospel, the spirit of the world has entered believers and defiled the gospel. Now, this falling away or apostasy is quite evident in North America as church attendance plummets and less and less people say that they believe in the Bible. Now, although modern-day church does not exclusively live in Babylon the Great, it is apparent in Scripture that there are a large number of people or believers living in her before she is judged. Jeremiah said, I have filled thee Babylon with men as with caterpillars, so raise up a shout against her. Revelation says, Come out of her, my people, and be not partaker of her sins concerning Babylon. Now, the largest number of Christians per capita in the world today is found in the United States of America. The description of these first three churches can easily be identified within the confines of Babylon the Great. Within the last two decades, political pundits recognize the intense political indifferences within America and have coined the phrase culture wars. Now, the Bible does not mention the term culture. It does, however, discuss two distinct spiritual kingdoms battling on earth. The opposing kingdoms are based exclusively on the acceptance or the rejection of God's word. God's kingdom of light and knowledge throughout history has always defeated Satan's kingdom of darkness and ignorance. However, those victories sometimes come at a great sacrifice for those who are on the front line of the battle. Now, most non-believers, or what we call atheists or secular humanists, give no regard whatsoever toward the Word of God as it is insignificant within their worldview. Believers, however, are mandated within Scripture to base their whole worldview on the biblical moral protocol of Judeo-Christian doctrine. This Bible or biblical worldview, however, 
is only held by a remnant of believers in the last days. We will discover in coming programs that five out of the seven churches Jesus described are corrupted by sin and told to return back to the word, which of course should be the first love of all believers. Now it's interesting to note that at one point in describing the believers of Smyrna, scripture references the synagogue of Satan who persecutes them. I know thy works and thy tribulation and poverty, and I know the blasphemy of them that are of the synagogue of Satan. That word synagogue in Greek means a house of assembly or a gathering place. Now assembly pertains to religious houses of assembly, political houses of assembly, or even social activist houses of assembly. Wherever people assemble and gather a group think or common ideology is considered a synagogue. This of course happens in all religious or political parties where its constituents are like-minded and have common values. However, the voices of political and moral change in America are now being voiced in sports, news media, and even in corporate America, which is driving an agenda politically. When an assembly of people are influenced by satanic inspiration, it will always oppose biblical principles and defy biblical moral protocol. The fruits of that ideology will sometimes manifest violence, bigotry, hatred, and outright rebellion against biblical standards. Hence, it becomes a synagogue of Satan, which means adversaries. This is very important in searching for the identity of Babylon the Great, because in Revelation 18.2, it says, Fallen, fallen, Babylon has fallen, become the habitation of every foul, unclean spirit, and every hateful bird or demon. What we're witnessing right now in America is a battle between people who have fallen captive to the satanic ideology and those who are clinging to the word of God. Now, a satanic ideology is like under the apostasy or falling away which always is opposes and hates Jews or Christians who are attempting to follow biblical protocol. Now, the Bible says Satan continually opposes the authority of the word as well as believers who are trying to follow that word. Now, when government, the justice system, and members of institutional law enforcement are seduced by corruption, they will inevitably be weaponized to persecute anyone standing against their agenda. The believers of Smyrna, unfortunately, suffer great persecution from these synagogues of Satan. Now, Jesus said the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Reuters report that Christians number 2.2 billion globally and represent 32% of the world's population. However, according to some studies, Christianity is the most persecuted religion in the world today. And that persecution always comes from governments whose leaders make laws for others, but don't adhere to those laws themselves. Up to 70,000 Christians in North Korea have been sent to labor camps for their faith. The Open Door Foundation claims that 83% of the world's population lives in nations where religious freedom is threatened or banned. There is unparalleled, brutal treatment of 300,000 secret believers in North Korea who risk their lives to follow their Christian beliefs. The Northern Korea regime formally demands for its officials to, in their words, wipe out the seed of Christian reactionaries. Now, over 250 million Christians worldwide are persecuted. That is one in 12 Christians worldwide. 65 countries worldwide participate in Christian persecution. Now, recently, 
President of Zambia stated in a news conference that the nation of Zambia will not abandon its religious and cultural moral norms and is rejecting the influence of the United States of America, who is pushing other countries to embrace the LGBT initiatives in government legislation. In seeking alternate financial partners, they are forced to go to China or Russia. Canada has now a five-year jail sentence for anyone who attempts conversion therapy on those questioning their gender. The U.S. is following the same protocol. How did two nations who were founded on Christian values become the vanguard for LGBT rights? What are we to do as Christians when the nation we love changes its value system to enforce laws contrary to Scripture? Is persecution coming? Or has it already begun? Jesus gives us the solution for the church of Smyrna. He says, be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Now, these verses should speak loudly to the one and a half million Christians of the Mideast who have suffered martyrdom or been forced to leave their homes due to the ravages of ISIS, a global jihad of hatred very similar to that of Hitler is being released on Jews and Christians. But that same hatred towards Jews and Christians is not coming to America. It's already here, folks, and it has infiltrated our government. You know, recently my wife and I traveled to Poland and we toured several Nazi death camps. Our guide for the trip was Holocaust survivor Irving Rom. Irving shared with us how he and his family suffered in the death camps and would never forget the day when Nazi guards, for some reason, were nowhere to be found. Suddenly, the door of his barracks was, was kicked open, and two American soldiers walked in, one white and one black, and said, you're free. However, something Irving shared with us was much more alarming than the death camps. He said that once Hitler and the Nazi Socialist Party gained power through the election process, the first thing they did was enforce a national BDS movement against all Jewish businesses. In fact, he said what some nations and activists are trying to enforce now against Israel is the same as during Hitler's rise to power. Today, Christians who oppose the woke agenda are also facing similar BDS initiatives from progressives in our country. Banks who have joined the WAF global agenda are discreetly closing individual bank accounts of clients who don't meet the new agenda of environmental social governments, or ESG, which is what the 2030 agenda of the United Nations is proposing. This agenda is not coming, folks. It's already here. So something is happening in the spirit realm around the world. Bible prophecy predicted, and we are watching its fulfillment through every form of media around the world. The synagogue of Satan is rising up, and the demons who controlled Hitler are once again to make another appearance in the history of planet Earth. In his book, Dark Agenda, David Horowitz explains that this conflict in culture did not occur overnight. It began in the early 60s when Madeleine Murray O'Hara, the infamous atheist, and the ACLU succeeded in getting Bible reading and prayer out of the school classrooms. Of course, the Bible was well ahead of Horowitz's revelation. Proverbs says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he'll not depart from it. Over a full generation, secular humanism in North America have taught our children that there is no God and they came from monkeys. And today we wonder why many grow up and act like animals. The senseless mass shootings, the total disregard for others, drug addiction, the amoral society that has no limits of sexual promiscuity, all these things have led to a confused generation unhinged from any conscious thought of the golden rule to do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. These children are now adults and have entered every segment of our society, including government. The word Babel, where we get the word Babylon, of course, means confusion. And Isaiah said, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, and my ways are higher than your ways. However, Romans 1 
tells us what a society looks like that refuses the knowledge of God. They become unthankful, ungrateful. They become filled with unrighteousness, fornication, covetousness, wickedness with a reprobate mind. Now, the word reprobate means a lack of biblical principles. So here we sit now in America and Canada. According to the woke agenda, men can have babies and biological men who say they are women can compete against biological women in female sports. People are no longer him or her. They are they, them, their, or we. Men who dress up like women read storybooks to children at public libraries and other public venues encourage them that you can be just like me. Now, according to the woke, gender is not determined at birth. It's determined by choice. If you even challenge that mindset, the progressive mob will attack you with every demeaning slur that they can conjure up, accusing you of hate speech. It's literally their word against God's word. Believers who are steeped in the traditional concept that Rome or some other city yet to be built as Babylon the Great are at a loss for words at what is happening in America. But for those of you who have followed the biblical research taught by Prophecy USA, the utter confusion exposed in America makes total sense. The prophets said it would happen. The Bible warns it would come. And those who have ears to hear can discern where we sit on God's prophetic time clock. America is Babylon the Great. You can blindly follow the herd, or you can diligently follow the word. You can speculate who Babylon might be, or you can discern the signs of the times and match scripture with reality. Now, the test for modern day believers in Babylon is will you stand for the word, its biblical protocols, or bow to the woke agenda of modern day Nebuchadnezzar's? Isaiah said, Hear now this that dwellest carelessly, and says in thy heart, I am, and none beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. For thou trusted in thy nake, in thy wickedness, and thou hast said, None seeth me. Thy wisdom and thy knowledge, it hath perverted me. And you've said, I am, and none else beside me. Now, while the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven to Nebuchadnezzar, saying, The kingdoms departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. Seven times shall pass over thee. For seven years, Nebuchadnezzar suffered from a mental illness known as bonethropy, where one thinks he's an animal. The Bible says we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but principalities and powers of darkness. Nebuchadnezzar has been dead for over 2,500 years, but the spirits who drove him into that darkness are still alive and well on planet Earth today. People within Babylon the Great are literally driven. They become unhinged with their godless ideology. They begin acting out their fr frustrations according to Romans 1 when God hands them over to a reprobate mind, and that is a mind that cannot discern between good and evil. Evil becomes good, and good becomes evil. We also have people in Babylon today, and movies turning people into werewolves, like, like lycanthropy. And the internet is full of the same. So just as Nebuchadnezzar lost his mind, so does a certain segment of our society within Babylon the Great. They're literally driven to achieve their godless agenda at any cost to others or to themselves. Our society today is filled with anxiety, fear, confusion. We have people identifying themselves as transhuman, escaping reality by claiming they possess the spirits of cats, dogs, elves, wolves, and a variety of animals. In his book, Dark Agenda, Horowitz explains that the progressive left movement today is fueled by the teaching of the late Saul Alinsky, who wrote in his book, Rules for Radicals, the first radical known to man 
who reveled against the establishment and did so effectively, won his own kingdom. Of course, he was referring directly to Lucifer. Alinsky's book, Rules for Radicals, also states ridicule is man's most potent weapon. Does this equate to the modern day slurs of war on women, homophobic, xenophobic? Should someone disagree with the progressive groupthink ideology? Perhaps the scripture stating the accuser of the brethren is cast down and then accuses them before God day and night would be appropriate here in America. In any type of warfare, you have intelligence and counterintelligence. This is also the case for spiritual warfare. 2,000 years ago, when an unhinged crowd screamed, crucify him, crucify him, everyone knew that Jesus had done nothing wrong. However, the wisdom and intelligence of God was amazingly discerning. For we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, there were no princes at the crucifixion, but the spirit realm that surrounds us, where principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness dwell, they worked through the assemblies of people who had gathered and screamed those words. Now, ironically, God knew exactly and prophesied exactly what the free will of some men would do when they rejected his son. And in the process, the spirits manipulating those men were putting a noose around their own necks, for without a crucifixion, there could be no resurrection. Without the shedding of blood, there could be no redemption. Without the price of death being paid for those sins, there could be no eternal life for those who believed. So the conclusion is this, without believers being confronted by these hostile spirits, there can be no victory if there is no battle. And the battle is on in America today. And according to scripture, it will cause many believers to fall away from their faith. From these verses, we enter two more descriptions of Babylon the Great. She's a nation that has God's people within her, and she's a nation that persecutes God's people. God has prophesied a specific outcome for Babylon the Great, but he also has a very special plan for those who serve him. Remember, he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, and he never fails to fulfill his promises. So something very, very good is about to happen to those who study this book and follow this word and obey his commandments. A day is soon coming where multiple prophecies will be fulfilled in rapid succession, and the miracle of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will pale in comparison to what God has in store for his chosen generation. But unfortunately, we're out of time right now. Don't miss next week's teaching. It will leave you speechless as we unveil the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. My name is Rick Pearson. This is Prophecy USA. We're reminding you Jesus is alive and he's coming back much sooner than many people think. See you next week on Prophecy USA. Shalom.